توبوا إلى الله جميعا أيها المؤمنون لعلكم تفلحون. My role is to talk about how we are able to abstain from these acts. What is the method? Some people are only in the beginning of enjoying these temptations of sexual acts and things that lead to them, music and drugs. Others are addicted to either one of them or two of them or all of them. Obviously the addiction is the worst state that one can be in, in those acts. Because the state after that is possibly suicide. And since my role is not to talk about history and statistics and the awareness of it, it's about how, it'll just suffice for me to tell you, for those of you who do know the world of music, drugs and sex, you will see that in the celebrities, suicidal rates are quite high. Suicidal rates are quite high and misery is very high. Elvis Presley, have you heard of him? I don't like to mention his name in the masjid, but for the benefit of the youth, it just strikes that nerve because what I'm about to say, inshallah, will make a lot of sense to you. A person may ask music, what has that got to do with drugs and sex? Well, they're all together, they're a package. It's the shaitan's package. This man, this great rock personality, why did he become famous? He became famous because he introduced a new way of looking at music. It wasn't just his voice. There were others who had marvelous voices. But it was what he introduced in the actions that he did up on stage. He introduced new sexual moves while he was up on stage as he sang. Music artists before him didn't do that. There was a little bit, somewhat of a modesty, or maybe not as bad of lack of modesty. He took it to the next level. And he became absolutely famous. It was those moves which he did as if he is practicing intimacy with a woman. And for this reason, he was extremely popular with women, four times more than the men. In the 60s and 70s, women used to cry when he was up on stage, as if they were all in that haram intimate act with him all at once. That's how he made him feel. When he committed suicide, and probably the result of overdose of drugs, Many women actually threw themselves off balconies and killed themselves to that point. It's always amazing how we find celebrities, especially musicians, drugs and sex comes with it. Not halal, haram. It comes with it. If you were to go to a nightclub, la samah Allah, God forbid, you'll find that these three things are there. If you take one of them, the other two will follow. Some way in some way or another. And I'll tell you a little story about myself. Uh, brothers may not like that you know, we talk about our past experiences, but I think that it's good for the youth to share this because we are all human. I'll tell you how the shaitan works 
with you. The more religious you are, the more he wants to play with your head. For me to tell you how to avoid it, you need to know how it comes about first of all. It all stems from the whispers of the shaitan. And I'll explain why it's the whispers in a minute. So one day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He granted me the wish to want to read the Qur'an nicely and I wanted to imitate certain mashayikh in their recitation. And people told me you have a nice voice. Allahu alam. But as time went on and I became a teenager, 18, 19 years old, there was a friend, I was giving him dawah, and he was talking on the phone. And I was reciting something from the Qur'an. Then he said, please brother, can you recite it to my friend in the phone? I said, okay, maybe it's for da'wah. So I recited a few verses, not knowing it was on the other line, and then I hear a girl's voice. And she sort of squeaked and starts saying, oh my God, that's amazing, it's a beautiful voice, can you come to my 21st birthday? Come on, come on, it'll be amazing, you just sing something. I said, what the heck, this is Qur'an. This is not music. She said, I don't care what it is, it sounds amazing. I have never been invited to something like that or ever before that having to face something like this before. And then I remembered the verse in the Qur'an where Iblis, alayhi la'natullah, he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he was an outcast and he became jealous and envious of Adam and he wanted to lead all of his children astray. That was his promise. See, it's all really a personal vendetta by a man, by this jinn called Iblis. This is the, all, the, all this sex, drug and rock, rock and roll is all the personal vendetta. He wants to get everyone back for his own personal and we're all, you know, falling for it. Well, some of us, inshallah, not all of us. And he said, لَهُمْ صِرَاطَكَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ I am going to sit awaiting for them, the children of Adam, on your straight path, on your religion. The shaitan is not going to leave you alone. You've got to be aware of your enemy, number one. That whether you become religious or you don't become religious, these temptations are his weapons. He comes to the religious person and to the non-religious person. So I'm not going to tell you right now that the trick to staying away from these or getting out of it is just to become religious. It's more than that. Because the shaitan is going to wait for you on your religious path. Here I am thinking I've got a really nice voice in the Quran. The shaitan brings along this woman to go to her 21st birthday. She praises me, compliments me. I feel butterflies in my stomach. I think, oh wow. Look what this woman has done to me. 18, 19 years old, in the prime of your life. But alhamdulillah, what had been drilled in my head, and this is what I'm coming to, it's not the fact that I was practicing for a little bit. You could be practicing for a year, but it's not really enough. You could not be practicing. What was drilled into this part of my head, the subconscious part, from a young age, was that the Qur'an and its meanings and the stories of the Sahabas and the hereafter and the heaven and the hellfire and the day of judgment and the punishment of the grave, the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always stemmed, came to the top. And that's what prevented me. After closing the fern, I said, Astaghfirullah, look. But what I realized was this, a voice. I was about to apply it to music. The music was going to take me to a party. The party is for a, a girl who is turning 21. A girl who is 21 has played with my temptations. Who else is going to be there? Other girls like her and other boys like her. What else is going to be there? Most likely drugs. The least is going to be marijuana. No party happens without some intoxication, girls and boys and music. Can you imagine switching off the music and the people only indulge in intoxications and women, the music comes with it. The last time I remember, I, can't, I don't remember a shaykh giving a khutbah and then starting to sing and dance, for example. 
He doesn't appeal to people that way, of course. And it will not suit to be in the masjid. The last time you listened to music, when was it the type that called you to the masjid? Can you imagine someone listening to music, to pop or to akon and so on and so forth? Especially some of the youth, they say, Oh, this celebrity and that celebrity, he's a Muslim, man. He's a Muslim. It's like some big thing that we have to be proud of. I wish they never said that they were Muslim, these celebrities and these musicians. But the last time we hear them, I don't remember a person listening to music and thinking, this is the way, now I'm, I'm, I'm interested to go into the masjid. The person listens to music and says, I want to go to the masjid. So the first and foremost thing that we need to understand is your enemy. Rasul Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ Do not follow the footsteps of the shaytan. The shaytan, as Abu Hamza said, he does not come to you with the haram to your, to your door. He actually brings it to you step by step. And this is how he does it. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhi, a great scholar, he said in his book, Adda' wa dawa the sickness and the cure. He said, every bad act begins with a thought. I want you to follow this formula with me. Every bad act begins with a thought. Now this brain, it continues to work. You were not created loving music. You were not created loving intoxications. And you're not created, especially as a baby or as a child, wanting to do haram acts. It starts with a thought. And this brain continues to bring in information. When you're asleep, it's thinking. When you're awake, it's thinking all the time. As you're sitting right now, it's thinking. Suddenly, a bad thought comes from two places. You need to know where they come from. Number one, from something you've heard, something you've seen, something you've touched, something you've experienced, something you remember. The other way it comes to your brain is from the shaitan. You'd be sitting there doing nothing. There are no temptations around you. No TV, no internet with any temptation. There are no physical things around you. There's no one whispering to you. And then suddenly, suddenly, out of nowhere, a bad thought comes to your head. This is from the shaitan, the whispers. He said, it is easy to repel the thought. So do not let it get to the second stage. The second stage, if you don't repel the thought by distracting it with something else immediately, then it turns into an idea. An idea. When it turns into an idea, it sticks more in the brain, longer. And then it becomes a little bit more difficult to repel. You must distract your mind and busy yourself with something else immediately. If you do not do that, then it turns into a plan. You start planning for it. And now the temptation comes in. Now the sin comes in. The plan comes in. Up to this point, there's no sin. There's no sin up to this point. I had a brother asking me, saying, Brother, there's whispers that come into my head of haram. Am I earning any sin? I said, SubhanAllah, Rasulullah was approached by his companions with the same thing. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, there are thoughts that come through our brain. If we were to tell you about them, we would rather be burnt in the fire than for you to know. Rasulullah became happy and he said, Awatajiduna Velik? Fa'la, do you really find that in yourselves? They said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Alhamdulillah, Alladhi Radda Kaida Shaytani ila al Waswasa. Alhamdulillah, who has returned the strength of the Shaytan only to merely whispers. To hate to people and to know them about you is a sign of your Iman, is a sign of your modesty, is a sign of your fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the fact that they're still in there and you're not acting upon them, alhamdulillah, is good. When it turns into a plan, now the sin becomes. You start planning how you're going to go about it. If you do not repel the plan, then it turns into an action. Once you do the action, then you feel the sweetness or the taste of it. And this is a bad sweetness. It's like poison ivy. It's got a poison with it. Once you taste it and you see the indulgence in it, whether it's because of your friends you want to appear good in front of them or whether because uh, the shaitan made you think that there is a secret that you're missing out on, 
Because you see that Allah says in the Quran, وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَعْمَالَهُمْ فَصَدَّهُمْ عَنِ السَّبِيلِ Allah says, the shaitan made the haram look so decorative in their eyes, and so he took them off the straight path. He makes it decorated to you. So there has to be a secret, you think. I wonder why I don't drink alcohol. I wonder why I can't indulge in haram intimacy with other, the, the opposite gender. I wonder why I can't listen to music. There has to be a secret. Everybody seems to be enjoying it. Every, as Brother Sheikh Abu Hamza said, that that woman, she acted as if she was happy. And this is the, the state of everybody, isn't it? We go on Facebook. I mean, Facebook. Did I say Facebook? I said Facebook, didn't I? We go on Facebook, for example, unless you're using it for da'wah or for good purposes. And we see fakeness. We, uh, fake society, the shaitan makes you act. And then what happens? You turn that act into another act. You try it again. Then you want to do it again. And then you start tasting the indulgence in these temptations. As you continue to repeat these acts, he said, then it turns into a habit. And once it turns into a habit, then that is the most difficult to reverse. The habit becomes an addiction. How did it all begin? With a thought. Repel the thought. Turns into an idea. Repel the idea. Otherwise it turns into a plan. A plan, if it's not repelled, it turns into an action. First time you're innocent, you can still let it go, inshaAllah. Go and do some salat when you do an action. Rasulullah was approached by a man. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I've fallen into haram. My eyes commit zina, my, my hands have committed zina. He said, did you commit the actual zina? He said, Ya Rasulullah, my eyes committed zina, my hands committed zina. He said, did you do what a husband does with his wife? And then he said, no. He said, go and pray and do good deeds, it'll wipe her away. Now, you might be thinking, is it that simple? I just go and pray a couple of prayers and then I'll have another go? I'll watch something haram and I'll just go and pray and it'll get rid of it? No, that's not what he was saying. Rasulullah wanted him to attach himself to the connection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after, immediately after doing a sin, because he felt guilty. And when you feel guilty, right at that point, go and do a good deed. Go and give sadaqah, go and make dua, go and pray, go to the masjid, go and read the Quran, go and teach someone something, uh, go and learn something from the Quran. Say salam alaikum to someone. Go and do something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with right at that point when you feel the guilt because the shaitan is on top of you and this is the way you'll get rid of him insha'Allah ta'ala. Each time you repeat the good deed, it wipes away the sin because your heart gets a dot inside of it. It's a metaphoric dot and you feel it inside of you. When you do the good deed, it wipes it away. The best time is when you feel guilty. The best time is when you feel that the world is over for you. So you go and worship Allah. So each time you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it cleanses you. Once it turns into a habit, it becomes the most difficult. And remember what I said in the beginning that the shaitan, he whispers to you. Why does he whisper? Whispering has its effect on the subconscious mind. And there is a special place in the brain that gets affected the same way as you get affected with drugs. You get affected with pornography that with it, you get affected with uh, music, and you get affected when it is drugs. It's the same place in the brain. Now you might be thinking to me, well there's some music that brings me, you know, makes me feel happy and so on. I agree with you. There is some music that makes you feel happy, makes you feel upbeat, makes you become inspired, makes you feel motivated. It's true. But as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about alcohol and gambling, He said, He said, it has benefit for people. But their harm is greater than their benefit. And this is the reason Allah forbid alcohol and He forbid gambling. Music has some benefit, I'm not going to lie to you. You enjoy music sometimes. But the harm of it is outgrows its benefit. How? If I asked anyone today, young people especially, what kind of music do you listen to? Will the majority say to you, classic Beethoven? Huh? I listen to the violin. And I enjoy classical music. I'm into classic. No, they're not going to say that. They're into the pop music. They're into that other stuff that makes you go crazy and wild. And what comes with it? The other two stuff. 
So the first thing, my brothers and sisters in Islam, is to understand when an addiction happens, how did it become? When it became a habit, it's affecting that same place in the brain over and over again. The only way out of an addiction is to reverse the process the same way you started. And to do that, you need willpower. Allah has given you a power more than what you can imagine. It's called willpower. Allah has given us a will. Naam. And the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best way for that willpower to work. Immediately go and listen to some lecture about hellfire. Listen to something about the day of judgment. Listen about the things that make you fear. Normally, this is what makes you wake up. And then listen about something that gives you hope. Jannah, repentance of Allah subhanahu, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How Allah accepts you no matter how far you go. Just in case, just in case the shaitan then whispers to you and says to you, you've got no hope, you're going to hellfire. Listen to the hope that Allah is more merciful than what he, is, what, what he bestows his anger. On top of his throne, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote, Inna rahmati ghalabat ghadabi. My mercy has overcome my anger. I won't talk too much about that because Sheikh Abu Ahmad will be talking about repentance. So when you listen to these things and you go and hit it right at that point, then insha'Allah the willpower becomes strong. At that point, you need to reverse the process of what happened in your brain. How? The same way it came in over and over and over, you now reverse it over and over and over. The word is dhikr. Dhikr means repetitive remembrance. Listen to what Allah says in the Quran. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ Did you hear the expression? عَنِّي فَإِنِّي This is deliberate. In the Quran, when, especially in the Arabic language, when you express something and prolong it in such a way, إِنِّي is expressing that it is يعني, always. It's all the time. And ibadi means all my slaves, all my servants. If any of my servants at any time, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim, they call out to me, then I am, he said, I am always close. As if it's a second sentence. I've always been close, I am close, and I always will be close. Ujibu da'wat al-da'i idha da'an, da'i idha da'an. I respond to the caller, idha da'an. The word idha means repetitive. It's different to saying in. In means conditionally, if he calls upon me. But Allah said, Idha. Idha means a lot. You have to get into the habit of calling upon Allah a lot. Because what happens when you keep doing that? Your brain starts to change. What happens when you repeat the words of Allah? Your brain starts to change. Suddenly your dreams, when you're asleep, they start to change. Once you see your dreams changing into things that seem close to Allah or the fear of the Day of Judgment, then you know that your brain is starting to change. You have to continue with these words of dhikr. And then it helps you lessen from the habit which you were doing. As the brain starts to change, then you become addicted to something halal, insha'Allah. One by one. Even the non-Muslims, you go on YouTube and they put these things, repetitive words. If you want to become confident, they say, put these earphones in your ear and say, I am confident, I am confident, I am confident. It's just repeating, repeating constantly. What's it actually doing? It's actually changing that part of your brain. And it becomes easier as time goes on. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, however, did say, and I'll end it with this, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ Seek help from patience and perseverance and prayer. Now, salat here doesn't necessarily mean only the five daily prayers. Salat comes from the root word sila, which means to connect. You need to find different ways of how to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through nature, through salat, through dua through the Qur'an, through hanging out with the friends and people who remind you of Allah, who say it to your face, who wear their hearts on their sleeve and say, brother, take you aside, I want to advise you. With these types of people, the environment that you put yourself in and the environment you take yourself out of, inshaAllah, are things 
that you use to connect yourself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sabr, patience means that you not only perseverance, like let's say I'm doing haram, I just sit there and accept it. I'm patient. Oh God, I can't do anything about it. No, patience has three meanings. Number one is to be patient when you are afflicted with a harm, such as sickness or some kind of disease. You can't do anything about it. Don't rebel against Allah and accept it as it is and keep continuing to call upon Allah. The second meaning is to be patient in staying away from sin. You have to exercise some willpower to stay away from some of these sins. So if, you're, if you've got a habit of looking too much at something haram, lessen it. You have to exercise some of that ability. Then that ability becomes stronger and stronger and stronger as you put that willpower in place. And the third thing is to be patient in continuing with your acts of dhikr, with your acts of salat. You know, not everybody finds it easy to f wake up for fajr. And you know, when you wake up, you feel tired naturally, but you have to exercise that patience, fight it, wrestle with it. It doesn't, it doesn't just come from thin air. A person comes to you and says, well, I want to pray, but it's just, I don't know if Allah has written it for me. A sister comes and says, I want to put on the hijab, but I don't think I'm ready. You are ready. You are ready. You just have to exercise that willpower. Say, I am going to do it. Make that decision. Make that decision. Big word. It's a, it has a very powerful place. Don't let your parents or the sheikh or anybody else make the decision for you. When you own your own decisions, own them, make the decision yourself. Wallahi, you'll find that you're going to be so powerful. You're able to practice it. Say to yourself today, I'm going to start to do these dhikr things. Every day I'm going to sit down, I'm going to get this book called Husnan Muslim, Fortress of the Muslim, and I'm going to take one of the du'as in there. And I'm going to say it a few times a day, once in the morning and once at night before I sleep. I'm going to make it the first thing I say when I wake up, and I'm going to make it the last things I say when I go to sleep. Do it for a few days, 30 days, 40 days, 50 days, and watch what happens to your brain. Things start to change in you, insha'Allah ta'ala. Allah assists you. And this is the patience we are talking about. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist us and forgive us and grant us patience, perseverance. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the hidayah and be with us all the way 